Members of the Green Party of England and Wales are currently voting to elect new members of the Green Party Executive, commonly known as GPEX. Now, I'm going to be joined today by one of the candidates who's standing for the Publications Coordinator position on GPEX. But before I introduce them, I just have one thing to ask of you, which is that you scroll down right now and hit subscribe. So that, with that out of the way and without further ado, we're absolutely delighted today to be joined by Edward Milford. Edward, how are you doing? Yeah, doing fine, thanks. We've got a nice sunny day after a few pretty grey wet ones, so it doesn't last feel like there's a little bit of summer here. Glad you're enjoying the start of summer in mid-August. Um, so let's kick things off, hopefully nice and straightforwardly. Why are you standing to be the Green Party's next publications coordinator? Um, well, I've been on GPEX before. I was on for four years from 2009 to 2013, uh, which covered the period when Caroline got elected. Um, and I'm keen to support the party in any way that I can. I think we've got a very interesting and challenging time approaching, uh, particularly as the next general election is coming. Um, we've shown that we can do well in local elections and that we need to continue that momentum. But the really crucial thing now is to break through at parliamentary level. Um, and so um, various friends and colleagues in the party suggested I might like to put myself forward again. I thought, yeah, I could uh, offer myself and see whether that's um, going to be uh, of interest and use to the wider party membership. So, yes, I'm standing. So I want to pick up on... Um the issues there you raised about the next general election and I guess the political direction of the party but before I do that I just want to delve into some of the I guess portfolio specific areas um, of the publications coordinator role um, yeah. so one of the areas that the publications coordinator is responsible for is sort of overseeing Green World which is a publication which the Green Party produces it used to be in print it's now solely online and I wanted to ask you um, how you saw how you could see yourself improving the work that Green World does so, yes, it's an important part of the, the party's communications, though the actual content and format is determined by the editor and the editorial board. So the role of the publications coordinator on GPEX is to support that structure um, and to make sure that it's on course and, and meeting the party's wider goals. So in terms of the actual uh, content, the publication coordinator is a member of that team, just like anybody else. They're not somebody who can set the policy. So I think more important then is to think about the way that the publication is being used, how widely it's read, how it's getting out to reach its target audience. And that's where I hope that the publishing skills I've got from four decades of working in publishing can come into that. Um, in the past, I've worked on magazines, books, uh, journals and other things. Um, I was the publications coordinator when we put it out to a professional organisation to run it back in 2000. 10 or 11, I can't remember exactly which year it was, um, at which stage it was still a primarily a print-based publication. So I think the important steps, first of all, will be to understand the readership. Well, that's the party membership by and large. Do we want it to be wider than that? Who are we really aiming for? And then we need to, uh, with the editor and the editorial board, to think about the content and whether we're meeting the needs of that readership. So that's always going to be the key thing. What is it that we want to get across in the in the publication? Um, and is it of interest to the readers? I mean, we should have good stats about how many people are seeing it, how many, how many articles are opened, how many are read all the way through, and to use that to inform decisions about ways to get it better used and, and better known about. So you mentioned something there at the beginning of your answer around um, the fact that Green World is currently managed by an external organization so it's essentially been sort of outsourced in terms of the, the production delivery of um of the publication the content obviously remaining with the editorial board now that's been a comment there's been a conversation that's been ongoing within the party for quite some time now about whether that's the the right model to use um so i wanted to ask you whether um, obviously you were involved in the decision to outsource it whether you uh, thought that, that that model has uh, worked and whether you think that green world should be uh, outsourced or whether it should instead be in-house so when we outsourced it before, it was primarily a print publication and it was a huge burden on a couple of people who were basically doing the print production as volunteers. Um, and they said they had most of the skills, but it was a 
it was really quite an unfair burden for that level of work, which is why we, we took the decision to outsource at that stage to go with a professional magazine contract publishing operation based in Bristol. Um, obviously, things are different now. It's, it, there's not a print version at the moment. Um, we it is a, a membership organization newsletter so i think i have to say i'm just agnostic on that i think one would need to look at what the needs are um how much time would be involved what the costs are and then make a decision on that basis i think there are pros and cons about um using outside agencies for things like this um and i don't know which way the balance would fall um, but yes i understand it's a live conversation and it's it's one that i think one just has to sit down and and look at the, the, the specific details in this case. So I'm going to move on now to talk about some of the more general GPEX responsibilities and the, the kind of wider things that are interest, of interest to members of the executive and people voting um, in these elections. So let's start with the area that you kind of talked on before, which is around, I guess, the, 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 the party's political trajectory, strategy, objectives and so on. Um, so for viewers watching, uh, GPEX is one of the two governing bodies in the party alongside the Green Party Regional Council, GPRC, um, and GPEX has some responsibilities for um, delivering the party's political strategy and overseeing its political ambitions. And so what I wanted to ask you today is um, what do you think the Green Party needs to be doing right now to make sure that it can meet its political objectives and ambitions? Gosh, yeah. Um, so, as you say, I think it's important to recognise that GPEX does not set those political goals. Obviously, conference is the sovereign body and there are uh, policy making organisations within the party to determine the policies. Um, and by and large, uh, I'm very comfortable with most of the policies that emerge from that. Um, there's probably a few details in a few places that I would probably do slightly differently, but I don't think they're significant. Um, so I think GPEX's main role as a body is to then uh, put the mechanics in place for, for, and, and the resources um, to try and translate that into political office. As a political party, we exist to win political office. Um, as I say, I think we've, we've shown that Target to Win works really well at local election level. And I think scaling it up is the challenge at the moment. Can we do a target to win campaign, a proper target to win campaigns on a constituency wide basis? Um, and I don't think um, those who've been close, more closely involved with Brighton and Bristol campaigns in the past may correct me. I did a, a bit of work at the last in Bristol at the last general election campaign. I don't think we've really hit the full target to win methodology with a proper long campaign for a long time. Um, so can we keep that focus? Can we have the resources available to do that? Um, how many seats can we realistically tackle? I know there are four particularly that we've got in mind for this one and a couple of others that maybe we would call development seats. And of those four, two are rural, which have slightly different challenges. I think the political issues are pretty similar, but the logistical issues and the mechanics need to be a bit different. Um, and I really think that if we can get a group of MPs, that would change the political landscape quite significantly. Um, I think a lot of the noises coming out of Labour are incredibly disappointing about the, um, oh, the, what's the word, um, some sort of proper progressive politics, grown up progressive politics taking place in the UK. It's just truly depressing that the tack that they're taking. Um, so I would hope that if we can have a small group of committed uh, Green MPs, we can really make a big difference. Um, so that's got to be the focus. But at the same time, we need to keep the momentum going at local elections and, and regional ones as well, of course, because there'll be London mayorals next year too. Um, so I think the, the role of GPEX is to try and ensure that we keep that focus and that we have the resources in place with that as, as our political target. Uh, and so the second area I want to talk to you about is uh, finances. So the Green Party uh, executive, GPEX, is the body that's responsible for the financial uh, well-being and management of the party. And so I wanted to ask you what your experience is of um, working in organisations and managing large complex difficult budgets um well i think i've got a fair amount of that um i say i've worked in publishing for four decades i set up my own business uh back 
um, 20 something years ago and ran that for uh, the best part of 20 years. Um, and that did reasonably well. It employed, uh, we were just under 40 people by the time that uh, that was sold. Um, so there was um, plenty of budgeting involved in that. And organizations of the same sort of size and scale at the Green Party. And since then, I've had uh, both non exec roles with other publishers. Um, so I'm working with several other smaller publishers, such as Pluto Press. Um, on their boards, looking at their budgets and their challenges, and trying to, I hope, offer some experience and, um, uh, yeah, experience and judgment on those. But I'm also involved with several local organisations, um, an arts charity, and so on, um, where there are then different challenges, um, particularly around fundraising and uh, and things. So, yeah, I've. I think I've got a good set of experience uh, across a range of organizations, commercial and non-commercial, of this sort of size. So, um, as I say, I was on GPEX before, so I know what some of the issues were 10 years ago. Um, I don't suppose they've changed that much. And so the last question I wanted to ask you on uh, GPEX before I move on to the slightly more flippant questions that I like to end these interviews on um, is around transphobia in the Green Party. Now, this is an issue that's been um, pretty dominant in the party for the last uh, five or six years, um, where, you know, I mean, I've, I've been doing these interviews uh, for GPEC selections, for leadership elections all that time, and uh, consistently in the campaigns, it's an issue that continues to come up. Um, so what I wanted to ask you was, as a member of GPEX, how would you use your role to help tackle the issue of transphobia in the Green Party? Okay. Um... So again, uh, the main body within the party that formally that deals with issues of discrimination and things is GPRC. So that's where the primary responsibility lies. So the comments that I make are as a more as a party member and yeah, somebody who might be on GPEX. Um, and obviously, I start with my own perspective. I'm a white cis male, so I don't have the same lived experience that many people do. Um, and so the first thing I need to be conscious of is actually listening to and learning from those who are actually directly involved by all these issues. Um, I recognise that trans people are particularly, but not exclusively, are hugely discriminated against in society at large, and I'm sure there are pockets of that within the party. Um, I believe that we've got a good set of policies by and large, um, which I say I would support. And that we've commissioned the diverse matters, I think it is, to, to wrote a report on ways through this. Um, I'm also sure that politics, any political party needs to be a big tent. We need as many people on our side as possible. Um, if we want to win our campaigns, we need to be as unified as we can be. And that if we're fighting amongst ourselves, we will not come across well to the electorate. Um, and we need to get through this issue. We need to work out something that everybody's comfortable with. Um, I don't know what that is. I've not looked at this issue in detail. Um, as I say, I need to learn from my colleagues who um, have direct experience of this um, and recognise the struggles that they've had and what the lessons are. I think the only other thing I would add is that, um, well, two things, I suppose. One is that um, we really have big en huge enemies outside of the party. And that, I hope, is our big five is not amongst ourselves, but taking our messages, and that includes significant messages on discrimination and so on, to the wider world. If we can get more people elected, hopefully they will be carrying that message more widely. And then the second point is that uh, within society as a whole, um, toxic masculinity and male violence is a huge problem. And uh, what I could help with, I hope, as a male, is to then challenge that where I see that and um, to recognise that as one of the big factors behind a lot of the discrimination that people endure. So I promise to move on to the slightly less serious questions, and now I will. Um, okay. I'm going to start with one, um, I guess, that links back to something that you said earlier. So earlier you said that uh, you agree with almost all the Green Party's policies and that you're comfortable with them. But what I wanted to ask you is, uh, what is your favourite and, crucially, your least favourite Green Party policy? Um, I think uh, 
probably the, the, the favorite uh, the set of economic policies that we've got to really try and reshape um, economics. If I you know, pick out one of those, it might be um, universal basic income, for instance, as a way of really thinking about society differently. Um, and but, but I think the whole set of economic policies of moving the focus away from this ridiculous idea that we can grow forever on a finite planet and actually start to reprioritize well-being. Um, so those are the ones that I, you know, I think are, are really important to take out and, and get more widely accepted. Um, I don't, I don't know, just we we struggle sometimes on issues around, say, population or nuclear power. I mean, just oh, I don't want to go there particularly. I think um, to be honest, I think if I with any policy. The more detail you get, the more there is that you might say, well, we could do it a bit differently here, we could do it a bit differently there. So I think for campaigning, and I see myself primarily as a campaigning type person rather than a policy type person, I love the fact that we've got people within the party who really enjoy doing that detail and the good of it. Um, so I don't tend to get right down into the weeds. I just think, oh, well, you know, other people are thinking about that. It's perfectly good minds working those things out. Um, so. Yeah, I think there are, there are a few details down 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 the bottom that um, we might struggle with. Um, but yeah. I'll Is let you off the hook on that so. one. That's totally fine. Uh, my second question of these slightly less serious ones is what book has most influenced your politics? Um, I do read quite a lot. Um, I'm in a book club still that reads nonfiction and particularly around issues of sustainability and development. So. Um, I, we just read a very good book about activism, which I thought called Entangled Activist, which was really interesting. Um, the, the first book I've read in, in the environmental space was a book on nuclear power by Walt Patterson back in the 70s, which really just set me on this track. I think of the books I've read recently, the one that has really helped shape my thinking is Kate Rayworth's Donut Economics, where I think it's really a, a useful way of thinking about the, the twin challenges we've got to live within planetary boundaries but in a way that everybody's got enough. So those two rings of the donor really are the fundamental planks of sustainability and they are inextricable. You can't have one without the other. The idea that there's some sort of technological solution that allows the super rich to go on doing everything they're doing, is just for the birds. Um, there are billions of people in the world and many millions of people in the UK who, who don't have enough, for whom some sort of decent standard of living, some sort of you know, equality of opportunity is really important and we've got to campaign for them as much as for the, 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 the sort of the, the technologies and other ways of organising society that will keep us within the planetary boundaries. Who is your favourite historical figure? Ah, I'm, this is a tricky one in the sense that I, I heard a really good talk by Gary Young on why he's not in favour of any statues at all because Everybody's really got feet of clay. So I'm going to take a fairly uh, simplistic answer. Somebody who has been there, well, not anymore, of course, but for much of my art life was Nelson Mandela, who I think really embodied um, consistency, um, principle, not without his flaws, judging, you know, I've read uh, some of his biography and things, but he achieved great things through uh, great methods and I think South Africa was very lucky to have him leading a significant period of transition that could have gone awfully wrong. Um, there's still many, many problems in South Africa sort out of, and I'm not saying they've all gone by any means, but I think in terms of what we can aspire to, somebody with that sort of character and consistency would be, uh, yeah, would be helpful. And finally then, who in the Green Party inspires you the most? Uh, who inspires me the most? Um, there's a sort of, there's an answer which I shouldn't stick with because it's not one person. I, I am in awe of our 700 plus councillors, the amount of work they get through. Uh, and I've seen it firsthand working with local councillors, both in London, when I was in London, we had some on uh, Camden Council and more recently here. They are phenomenally hardworking. And I think about what other councillors get away with. And I think, how wonderful that we have so many dedicated people. Um, I've always loved hearing Caroline speak, though. I think her 
way of expressing green ideas clearly and accessibly is terrific. So uh, I'm really, I'm not surprised she's put so much in, you know, we've got to see people as people and not as bigger heads. Um, I, you know, the fact that she's stepping down, well, we've got to rise to that challenge. We've got to broaden the base of people who can speak with that clarity and that vision and articulate things as well as she does. It won't surprise you to know that you're not the first person whose name Caroline puts <laughs> in their answer to that question. Um, so that's all we've got time for today. Uh, Edward, okay. it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you and uh, your audience. So that was my interview with Edward Milford, who, of course, is standing to be the Green Party's next publications coordinator. I've interviewed the other candidates who are in this race as well. You can catch my interviews with them by heading to our YouTube channel. Whilst you're there, make sure you subscribe so that you don't miss out on all the other interviews that we put out. I'd love to hear what you thought about this conversation. And please let us know what you thought in the comments down below. If you are able to, please do head to bright-green.org forward slash donate so we can continue to put out interviews like this and all of the articles and coverage that Bright Green does. So that's it from me today. Thank you all so much for watching and I will see you all very, very soon.